What connects an African hunter, a local prostitute from Leopoldville, and Freddie Mercury? Chimpanzee, pretty or not, gave that young African nomad HIV in 1908, and he shared his illness with a working girl. It happened unknowingly, of course. After 83 years on November 24, 1991, a talented musician and showman, Freddie Mercury, died from the same virus. HIV, and its final stage, AIDS, pulled out of him all his life, all the spark and incredible energy that illuminated and set in motion everything around him. Today, we will tell you about how Freddie Mercury spent the last years of his life. Who did infect him? How did he deal with his illness? And what was the most important thing for him on his deathbed? Biographer Express is with you. Get comfortable, and we're starting. He was tired. According to various sources, Freddie found out about his illness between 1986 and 1987. Some thought he received a positive test in 1985 during one of his stays in Munich. But he didn't want to believe it. But even then, relatives and friends noticed the first changes in the artist. And although the first analysis in the same year showed a negative result, it was possible to relax for a while. The state of health was rapidly deteriorating. The second test was less encouraging. Moreover, there was a well-known symptom on the shoulder, Kaposi's sarcoma. From that moment, Freddie lived in the knowledge that he was HIV positive. Jim Hutton, the last of his lovers, said, His attitude was, life goes on. I'm not going to let this thing beat me. He took AZT and nearly every other drug available. For five years, the artist intensely concealed his illness and worked as hard as he could. He understood that he did not have much time, but there were many plans. He wanted to do as much as possible. During that period, he managed to re-perform at the Wembley Stadium in July of 1986, deservedly securing his previous success. He traveled around the countries with concerts on the Magic Tour, promoting the band's albums. You can see marks on his face and bumps on his cheeks in the photos from the tour. According to some opinions, it may indicate Kaposi's sarcoma and herpes zoster, symptoms of those infected with HIV. Freddie was actively engaged in creativity, not giving the disease a chance to rule his life. In addition to developing his solo career, he continued to work with Queen, preparing material for the future. And you're rushing hey! Rumors about the artist's illness was actively spreading. The press had the information that Mercury had been tested for HIV. And since 1989, cardinal changes could be seen in Mercury's appearance. He lost a lot of weight and was pale. He obviously had a hard time with his job, but the artist stubbornly kept silent about his condition. F*** them, it's my business. Such was his attitude to what was happening around. While working on the video for the song I'm Going Slightly Mad in the winter of 1991, Freddie felt bad. The video was filmed intermittently. There was a bed in Mercury's dressing room where he could rest, and two bodyguards stood at the door. For filming, a thick layer of makeup was applied to his face, and a black wig was put on his head. Under the suit, the singer put on a long-sleeved jumper to hide his painful thinness. His colleagues recalled that even black and white clips for the latest artist's album could not hide his condition. Before his death, Mercury worked with the Queen in the album as much as he could. His efforts did not go unnoticed. Those works were released in 1995 on Made in Heaven, the band's last album. By the way, you'll be grateful if you write in the comments what your favorite Queen song is. Let's see which one will be the most popular among our viewers. There was a lot of speculation about how Freddie got sick. Basically, they all boiled down to the fact that HIV infections was associated with an active sex life of the singer. He started relationships with both men and women. And a long relationship with Mary Austin and later with Jim Hutton did not prevent him from spending one night with different lovers. Mercury was often seen in various gay clubs, especially during tours in honor of the new album. Freddie's colleagues got used to the fact that after the concert and dinner, their friend politely left them. In a limousine with tinted windows, he looked for those places where gays semi-legally gathered. Freddie behaved very well in London, recalled Paul Gambancini. Compared to how he was in New York or later in Munich, those two cities were the capitals of anonymous casual sex. John Reed, the band's former manager, claimed that it was enough for Freddie to walk up to a bar and say, you, and he got away with it. 
Later, when he lived in New York, the thirst for pleasure took possession of him completely, and it was there, I think, that the disease found him, he recalled. Despite addictions, Fred tried to protect his personal life from the public. At one stage on the road, he and his entourage would stay in one hotel and the rest of the band and crew in their entourage would stay in another hotel. And this was all to facilitate Freddie's covert nightlife. Writer Leslie Ann Jones would later tell. In the late 70s and early 80s, a terrible virus began to actively spread among the gay community in major cities around the world, which coincides with the period of the artist's active sexual life. Rumors about gay cancer soon began to appear, and Mercury himself personally knew people with that disease. The information about AIDS frightened Freddy. From the mid-80s, he began to stop active sexual contacts. He explained it by the fact that he started a new stage in his life. While in Munich and London, Mercury increasingly eschewed gay clubs, spending more time at Garden Lord. It seemed that nightlife began to lose its appeal to the artist. I thought sex was important to me because I lived for sex, and now I'm going on a completely different path. And of course, this HIV and AIDS scared me to death, and I stopped having sex. Fatigue increased. The situation was aggravated by the failure of his solo song, Love Me Like There Is No Tomorrow. The song was dedicated to one of Mercury's mistresses and friends, Barbara Valentine. The actress recalled that Freddie began to behave strangely during that period. Once, seeing that Mercury had cut himself, she tried to help him. He began to shout, No! Don't touch me! Don't touch me! She said that it was at that moment that she understood everything. After a performance at Wembley Stadium in 1986, the group, as usual, was waiting for rock and roll parties with naked girls and a sea of champagne, but it was not interesting for him. Those around him suggested that he had worried about his health. Colleagues recalled that Mercury had problems with his throat and lymph nodes during the last Magic Tour. He was forced to absorb candies before going on stage. His behavior also changed. Edney Spike, the keyboardist who played on stage with Queen during the tour, recalled how Freddie was quiet on the road. Fred was quieter. He no longer had the desire to go to a club and stay up all night like he used to. Many recall that during that period, Freddie looked anxious and excited. He worried, fidgeted, and crossed his legs. In 1987, the artist's health was failing more and more. By that time, he had done about a dozen HIV tests, which in all likelihood showed one result. But after the biopsy, he found that the form of AIDS was progressing in his body. Freddie was plagued by lymph nodes all the time, lost more than 10% of his weight, and felt constantly tired. Kaposi's sarcoma spread rapidly and caused skin lesions. The singer underwent treatment only during off hours, either very early in the morning or late in the evening, to maintain anonymity and hide his condition from the public. Inner strength and determination helped him stay afloat. I can overcome this, that was his approach. Peter Freestone recalled, When he got HIV, he never, ever talked to me about it, never wondered where he got it, in what country, in what city. It was a fact. It was a reality. He knew he would die. So why will he waste time for regretting? The artist's interview in 1987 showed that he understood the inevitability of imminent death. Uh, oh, darling, I'll be dead and gone, dear. I'll be fucking just starting a new life somewhere else, dear. Yeah. You mean you don't you don't expect to make health bones? No, no actually, so, yeah. I really don't care. You don't care. Really, no. I don't. I don't really care. I don't. I don't have any um, aspirations to live to seventy. No. Really. Really, and uh, I don't don't sound sort of um, morbid. No. But I mean, I know I'm 41, yeah. and 70 is a long way away, mm -hmm. and I don't give a damn. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I really, this is nothing. I have lived a full life, and if I'm dead tomorrow, yeah. I don't give a damn. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I live, you know, I, I really have have done it all. Mm -hmm. I really have. I love the fact that I that I um, I make people happy. Even dying, Freddie did everything in his own way. For the last few months, he had led a secluded life. The only people next to him were the housekeeper, his friend Mary, Jim, and his bandmates. He kept her close by when he became ill, Mark Blake said about Freddie's relationship with Mary. She had been there before the money, before the fame, and she was there at the end. She supported Freddie's idea to keep the nature of his illness a secret. And three weeks before his death, he decided to give up his AIDS medication. 
Authoritative doctors retreated and could not offer a solution. Experimental treatment with AZT was his last hope, but it did not give the desired result. Moreover, according to some of the artist's biographers, it became the reason for the aggravation of Freddie's well-being and significantly worsened his health before death. I think Freddie knew it was time to let go. Jim admitted that he could not see Mercury wasting away and avoided all sorts of talk about imminent death. The last time that Freddie spoke to Hutton was the morning of the day before he died. He wanted to look at his paintings. How am I going to get downstairs? He asked. I'll carry you, I said. But he made his own way, holding on to the banister. I kept in front of him to make sure he didn't fall. I brought a chair to the door, sat a minute, and flicked on the spotlights, which lit each picture. He said, Oh, they're wonderful. His friend and colleague, Roger Taylor, later shared his opinion about why Freddie kept his struggle with the disease to the last. He didn't want to be looked at as an object of pity and curiosity, and he didn't want circling vultures over his head. An equally serious reason was the artist's concern about how his image and the image of Queen would change after the announcement of such information. After all, although enough time has passed since the legalization of homosexual relations in Britain in 1967, society was still ambivalent about sexual relations that did not fit the standard. Freddie told about his illness already at death's door. On November 23, 1991, society found out about Freddie Mercury's illness. Following the enormous conjecture in the press over the last two weeks, I wish to confirm that I have been tested HIV positive and have AIDS. I felt it correct to keep this information private to date to protect the privacy of those around me. However, the time has come now for my friends and fans around the world to know the truth, and I hope that everyone will join with me, my doctors, and all those worldwide in the fight against this terrible disease. By the time the press secretary spoke his words to the media, Freddie was dying. He was dying in his huge bed in a room with faded yellow wallpaper. He had not eaten anything for two days, practically did not speak, and did not see. Life was maintained in the artist through the Hickman implant, through which medications came. But the condition was aggravated by Freddie's allergy to morphine, which could not help him get rid of the pain. If someone saw him at that moment, they probably would not recognize him. Behind the walls of his beloved home, the press roared and raged with the desire to bite off a tasty morsel of sensational news. Before his death, he took part in the fight against the deadly virus. He ordered to vest all rights to the song Bohemian Rhapsody to the Terence Higgins Trust, created to fight against HIV and AIDS. His lover Jim claimed that the official statement was not the artist's idea. Mercury was no longer able to do something. It was composed and released by his manager, Jim Beach and the partner was sure that Freddie himself would not want that. He wanted his private life kept private, he recalled. And a day later, he was gone. Freddie died from disease-related bronchial pneumonia at his London mansion. Hutton was with Mercury as he died. He was dosed on morphine and in Neverland. He wet himself. I knew that if he woke up and saw that, that there'd be blue murder, so Peter and I changed his underwear, and while I was putting his boxers on, I knew he'd gone. I don't know how, I was crying my eyes out. Before his death, Freddie wrote the song for his own funeral. You probably won't be surprised. The artist even wanted to turn his funeral into a show. He was buried according to the rite of Zoroastrianism. By the way, we talked about how the artist was connected with Zoroastrianism and other details of his life in our video with a full biography of Mercury. Click on the pop-up link to watch it. In the ritual, Freddie wanted to unite the world of music and his family's beliefs. The ceremony lasted only 25 minutes. The coffin with the artist was wrapped in a white silk cloth and a scarlet rose lay on it. At the funeral, there were only 40 close people. Peter Freestone, Freddie Mercury's personal assistant, described the ceremony as follows. Freddie's coffin was moved to the chapel to the sound of Aretha Franklin's You've Got a Friend. The two Parsi priests were dressed in white robes. The end of the service was accompanied by the voice of Montserrat Caballé, who performed the aria d'amour sous la lie rosi from Verdi Opry's second Travatore. Freddie never aspired to be like everyone else. Such a do was just in his spirit, and Freddie would have approved of him, he said. For a long time, no one knew where the ashes of the famous artist rested. He entrusted that secret to the only person in the world, his beloved and loving Mary Austin, who was more than a friend or wife to him. She was his closest person. 
According to her, Freddy asked to keep his burial place secret for a reason. He did not want his ashes to be dug up by his fans, as was the case with other celebrities. Mercury took care of those closest to him after his death. He left Jim Hutton 500,000 pounds. Jim bought a house in Ireland for that money where he lived until his death. Hutton claims that Mercury verbally stated that he would stay at Garden Lord, the mansion they lived in together, but since nothing was signed in writing, that caused problems later. The mansion and a fortune of $60 million were inherited by his faithful friend Mary, and therefore, over time, the entrance to the estate to Hutton was closed. In 1992, the Freddie Mercury Tribute AIDS Awareness Concert was held at Wembley Stadium in memory of Freddie Mercury. A wide variety of singers from Def Leppard to Elton John performed at it. They performed to honor the artist and to support the fight against the disease that claimed his life. Since Freddie's funeral, there have been many rumors about the place of his burial. According to the Encyclopedia of Dead Rock Stars, Austin may have scattered his remains on the shores of Lake Geneva because it's a place of which Freddie was extremely fond of and one where his statue was shortly to be unveiled. In 2013, fans discovered the location at Kensal Green Cemetery in West London. The plaque was inscribed with Freddie's birth name. The inscription on it reads, In memory of Farouk Balsara, September 5, 1946 to November 24, 1991. Pour être un jour presté tour avec ton man et mort. M. The letter M was interpreted as Mary, of course. But Mary was very vague about such claims. Very unlikely, she said, adding that the secret would go with her. There were also opinions that the artist's remains are in the cherry orchard near his home or somewhere in Zanzibar. Perhaps that way to say goodbye to the world was the last act of theatricality from the famous showman. But for Mercury fans, he will always live on in his music. No less difficult path, and in some ways even more tragic, was passed in the last years of his life by another famous performer, Michael Jackson. In our previous video, we talked about how he became a hostage to circumstances, drugs, and a tarnished reputation. What did happen with the King of Pop, and could it have been avoided? Click on the icon that appears on your screen and watch. We are sure some facts will surprise you. Biographer Express was with you. Like this video and see you soon.